Now I'm absolutely sure you know this feeling. You sit down, fire up YouTube, tune on to one of your favourite channels and you're magically transported back to a wonderful time in your life or sometimes not a wonderful time but you know what I mean and this happened to me not that long ago when I sat down, turned on YouTube and tuned into Big Old Words because the game he showed was a game that I did play back in the day albeit he played it on the NES and I played it on the ZX Spectrum and that game is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade so for his pleasure because I did have a few words with him back and forth about the game I'm going to show you what it was like playing Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade but not only in the ZX Spectrum, also on the Sega Master System. And if you want to see that, you just wait until after these. Now as I said in the introduction, this game was 100% inspired by James over at Big Old Words. And yes James, I know this has been a long time coming. Our channels crossed paths in the early spring of 2021, and as two content creators from opposite sides of the Atlantic, there was certainly a little bit of intrigue about what each of us had grown up with. Me of course on the 8-bit microcomputers in Scotland, while he was misspending his youth with the NES. And hand on heart, without a shadow of a doubt, I can say that James has been one of the biggest influences in my life for searching out NES titles that I missed out back in the day. But in February 2022, when he released his video on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, realisation dawned that perhaps some of the games were the same. Well, almost the same anyway. So without further ado, let's take a look at Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on the ZX Spectrum and the Sega Master System. Now I'm going to start with the Sega Master System port of the game because that game was released in December 1990 which was almost a whole two years after the 8-bit microcomputers got their version of this game and logic would dictate that this would be the ideal way to play the game. Though I will still add that despite coming out much later than the 8-bit microcomputers the NES version didn't see light of day until 1993 but that port is for much later on and as pretty as old boxes, manuals and carts are let's get on with the main show and the that is the gameplay. Now I'm not going to lie, it's been a hot minute since I played Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on the ZX Spectrum, but being a Lucasfilm game on a much superior gaming platform, surely I had the right to assume that the Sega Master System port of the game was going to be far superior in every department. And right off the bat, yes, graphically this is head and shoulders above what the ZX Spectrum could produce. Now I'm not knocking the ZX Spectrum graphics because that was a little machine that was never designed to play games on, so for the Sega Master System not to absolutely trick the ZX Spectrum when it came to the visuals would be an absolute travesty because no matter how pretty your visuals are if the gameplay is not there then you might as well flush your game down the toilet and repeat after me the mantra of gamers all over the world gameplay is king so dusting off the crusty memories of my time with this in the ZX Spectrum how does the gameplay compare and well I have to say there are a couple of issues with this particular port and probably worse than that, a couple of issues that was on the ZX Spectrum port that should have been removed from this one. Now the first issue being something that you probably noticed yourself even if you haven't played this game, and that is the speed at which Indy trundles along. Now I know a few of you out there might be thinking that the main protagonist in your video game doesn't have to move at the speed of light. You only need to look at Robocop to know that he doesn't need to run to get the job done. But when we're looking at a character such as Indiana Jones, you would expect a sense of urgency in his step. Now don't get me wrong, at least the enemy sprites don't move at any great speed either, and to be fair the speed of the gameplay was probably dictated somewhat by the capabilities of the 8-bit microcomputers, but we're not talking about an 8-bit microcomputer here, we're talking about a dedicated 8-bit console. So why they didn't crank up the speed just a little bit is somewhat beyond me. Now the next issue that I have with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on both the ZX Spectrum and the Sega Master System is a part of the game that you should be overjoyed to reach and that is finding your first ranged weapon. Well I say ranged weapon is only a whip but it does give you much more range than your fists and should therefore increase your gameplay pleasure quite dramatically. But on the contrary when Indy gets his whip in this particular game that's where my disappointment levels of the game sink to an all time low because the animation sequence to use the whip takes longer than my teenage children to get up and ready and out for school in the morning. 
And don't get me started on hitboxes because I just can't fathom what the programmers were thinking when they were putting this together. Another niggle with this game that crosses both the platforms is fall damage. Now you're thinking to yourself that fall damage is fairly common in most platform games. And yes, that's absolutely true. But the fall damage when you're playing Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade occurs while you're falling. So if you do take quite a dramatic misstep, you do have the pleasure of watching your health bar decrease as you sail through the air. Now to be fair to this particular mechanic, it does mean that you're life comes to an end well before hitting the ground sometimes, meaning that you can start the game over so much faster and you will be starting this game over so many times that you might appreciate those few extra seconds. Now for my final niggle in the Sega Master System, it's something that I didn't notice until I was several games in. Now the only reason I didn't notice this fact for so long was quite frankly for the stuff that came before, the bad hitboxes, the poor animation on the whip and the slow movement. But there was something else ticking away in the background that was going to prove another bane to my experience experience while playing this game, and if the metaphors haven't caught you up already, that's quite simply the countdown timer right at the top centre of the screen. Now this is a mechanic that is solely present on the Sega Master System version on the 8-bit microcomputers, there was no such timer. Well there was a sort of timer, we'll get to that later, but it was nothing like this one. And let me tell you, when you're playing this game moving so slowly with poor hitboxes and that slow whip animation, that time is going to slip away faster than your game in time when you become a parent. But would I recommend that you play Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on the Sega Master System? Well, yes, give it a go. It is very much of its time, it does have a few niggles here and there. Some of the mechanics will have you pulling your hair out by the roots if you still have hair at our age. Or if you're younger, your hair loss will come much sooner. But if you don't play it then, how will you know for yourself? It's as simple as that. And of course, you won't be able to compare it properly yourself to other ports of the game coming up, just like this one here, for my beloved ZX Spectrum. Now the ZX Spectrum was where I put my quality gaming time in, well at home anyway, the arcades were still king during the 80s, but we didn't always have pockets full of change, and everyone who was anyone had their own home system. And being the fully paid up geek that I was and still am, a ZX Spectrum release of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was definitely on my to get list. Now as previously mentioned, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade did come out on the 8-bit microcomputers first. And after getting the opportunity to play it on the Master System, I saw that it was almost a direct port. There are one or two differences though, so let's take a look at the gameplay now. Now fair warning to anyone who doesn't have any experience with the ZX Spectrum or even any of the 8-bit microcomputers, because the graphics you're about to see probably will look a bit odd to you. Now that's by no means saying that the graphics are bad, I'm just saying that they're just a little bit different to what you would expect from an 8-bit gaming console. First thing you'll notice, the screen is mostly monochromatic. Quite simply put, developers try to stick to one colour on screen for the graphics to combat that old infamous colour clash that you got in the ZX Spectrum. Now for anyone who doesn't know what the colour clash in the ZX Spectrum was, then I suggest you just search colour clash on the ZX Spectrum on YouTube and you will have a host of videos that will explain it to you properly. In layman's terms, the ZX Spectrum wasn't built to be a games machine, it was a home personal computer, so there was absolutely no thought put into systems where you could layer different graphics on top of other ones. When you tried to mix colours in the ZX Spectrum, well they all bleed together in one horrible blur. But let's get back to the game itself. As you can see, much like the Sega Master System, it's quite a slow plodding affair. To be fair to the Master System, the ZX Spectrum version is probably just a tad slower. Other comparable features with the Sega Master System is most definitely the whip mechanics. Again, you can see the animation for using the whip is just so slow, you're best just to use up the 5 shots and thankfully once you pick up the whip, you only get 5 uses out of it, so it's a limited ammunition whip, which is maybe odd in the real world, but thankfully in this game it's a bit of a boon because the punch animations are much faster and much more accurate. Now where the game tends to differ from the Sega Master System is the gameplay style itself. On the ZX Spectrum, the developers expected you to take a little bit more time with the game, they wanted you to treat it just a little bit more tactically, which of course suits the slow plodding gameplay. Now that doesn't mean of course they didn't want you to move on and if you recall from the Sega Master System footage there was that timer counting down at the very top of the screen. In the ZX Spectrum version however there is no clock there but you might notice something at the bottom centre of the screen that kinda looks like a party popper or an ice cream cone. Well that in fact is your torch and what happens as the game progresses that burns away and the game screen gets darker and darker until it gets to the point where you just lose a life. Now unlike the Sega Master System port you can replenish your 
your torch by picking them up as you go along the level. So that absolute sprint to the end that you were forced into on the Master System doesn't exist on the 8-bit microcomputer ports and makes for a much more pleasant experience. The hitboxes are still way off, the gameplay is still dreadfully slow, but even with the monochromatic graphics, I think you can all agree that this looks like a decent game. And hand on heart, if I was honestly going to recommend you to play any of these two ports that you've seen so far, then I would suggest that you would go with one of the 8-bit microcomputer ports, the ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64, whatever one you can get your hands on. Because for me, it was just a much more pleasant experience, and I don't even think that's rose-tinted glasses that's making me say that. But Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade didn't finish on the Sega Master System. There was a game several years later released for the NES, and I'm going to have a look at that now. Now this is going to be a nice short segment because this game here is the absolute spawn of Satan. Yes, I did complain earlier about the Sega Master System and of course the ZX Spectrum having slow plodding gameplay, and I think it's safe to say that you can see that there's no slow plodding gameplay when it comes to the NES port, and possibly to make a distinction between the different ports, Nintendo have cranked this game up to 11, things falling from the ceiling, projectiles firing at you from all angles, and you barely have a nanosecond to breathe. So I'm going to take back all the griping about the slow, methodical, plodding gameplay of the previous two ports, and never in a million years ever tried to play this version of the game ever again. But thankfully Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade didn't end here in the NES, there was one more and it was a game from Taito. So let's see if the legends of the arcade scene can save Indiana Jones on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Well, that was a big fat note, but if you're looking for a game that's got 70s porn music, then this is one you should definitely check out. Have a listen to this. But at least it's far more entertaining than a Ubisoft port on the NES, so it has that going for it at least, right? So there you go, that was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on the ZX Spectrum and of course the Sega Master System and of course I did have to drop in and check out the games on the NES because why not, they were there for me to play. Now this part of the video as always is all about you, I want you to drop down into those comments and let me know if you played any of these games back in the day including the NES versions or if you didn't play them, is this the first time that you've ever seen them and you want to see more? I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. Also, if you're new to the channel, I will put up a couple of boxes here and here and they will link you to other videos that you may be interested in. Thank you as always for watching and until next time of course, cheerio! Yeah.